welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. I am your host. Today's episode is The Solutionary Way with Zoe Weil. Food for Thought podcast is brought to you by the listeners of this podcast. Do not forget that. That means you. Thank you so much for valuing it. You can become a supporter at joyfulvegan.com. You can go to donate button there and become a member today. And today's episode is supplemented by support from Plain Products, a vegan owned company offering cruelty free, zero waste personal care products free of animal products. They offer shampoos, conditioners, body washes, body lotions, and so much more. This is alliteration for you. Plain Products packages all of their personal care products <laughs> in eco-friendly refillable bottles that you return empty when you're done. They even provide a label for you so you can put it on the box. They sanitize those bottles, they refill those bottles and put them back into the world. They make it so convenient, but this is basically closing the loop on waste, this refill system. You can visit joyfulvegan.com hair now to get your exclusive 15% off discount link and code on all plain products every single time you order. So head over to joyfulvegan.com slash hair and you can also find the link and the discount code in the show notes for this episode wherever you listen to podcasts. I think, I hope you will become a fan as well. Welcome to Food for Thought everyone. Speaking of being a fan... As I said, we're going to be having a chat with Zoe Weil today. It's rare, it's not common, but we do sometimes disperse our regular episodes of Food for Thought with special episodes, special conversations where I sit down with fabulous people who I know and who I know are making this world a more compassionate place, but you may not know them. There are so many heroes in this world, and Zoe Weil is one of them, and I can't wait to tell you more about her. Before I do, I just have a couple quick announcements. Our 2025 Joyful Vegan trips are all confirmed to depart, but we do have space in both the Paris to the Dordogne Valley in June of 2025, and we have a couple cabins in our Croatia cruise from Dubrovnik to Split, which is in September slash October 2025, we have two departures. One is already filled up, that's in September. And the second one is at the very end of September that goes into October, and that is in 2025. They're both selling fast. Head over to joyfulvegantrips.com and join me on one of those incredible adventures. I also have a vegan gingerbread housemaking online cooking class (laughs) over at joyfulvegan.com, so you can join me to learn how to make gingerbread house, gingerbread houses, Fun, vegan, of course, and seasonal. So I'm doing this for our upcoming holidays, winter holidays. And I have had so many people express interest in an online conference workshop on cultivating hope in dark times for this fall, 2024. So if you are interested, please add your name to the list, joyfulvegan.com slash events. I think it's going to happen because there's been so much interest, but I just wanted to give you a shot as well. Let's move on to Zoe Weil. Let me tell you a bit about her. I said she's a freaking hero. She's probably a bit more behind the scenes, maybe, but she is revolutionizing the education system to bring in humane education, and she's been doing it for several decades. Zoe began her humane education work visiting classrooms and schools and offering presentations and countless young people became vegan because of her, many of whom she's she's still in touch with like 20 years later. But what's so revolutionary and innovative about her work is that she wanted humane education to be integrated into the curriculum, not just as an add-on or a one-off. And so she co-founded the Institute for Humane Education, and she has dedicated her career, her life, to promoting compassionate and effective solutions to global challenges. That is what's so uh, inspiring about Zoe. She really is all about solutions. She is an author of several books. Her newest is the one we're going to talk about today. It's called The Solutionary Way. She has also written The World Becomes What We Teach, Educating a Generation of Solutionaries. Another book called Most Good, Least Harm, A Simple Principle, for a better world and so much more. As a longtime animal advocate, as a longtime human advocate and author 
and dear friend, Zoe's work continues to inspire me and continues to inspire thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have been touched by her work making this a more compassionate and just and sustainable world. Zoe was inducted into the Animal Rights Hall of Fame in 2010. She writes for Psychology Today. I love her Facebook. I do, I do talk about this in our conversation. Please follow her on Facebook. She lives in Maine and she lives just among nature. She's just immersed in nature and she takes the most incredible photographs of animals, wildlife, nature. And I think that comes from the fact that Zoe is just inherently curious. She leads with curiosity. She leads with compassion and intellect. She's just got this incredible emotional intelligence and the world is is better for it. So I think you'll see that in her photographs if you follow her over on Facebook. And I'm excited to share Zoe with you. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation, starting with something I said that surprised Zoe. I don't think I ever told her this. <laughs> so here we go. Enjoy the conversation. We have so much to talk about. You have just been doing such good work in this world for so many years. And I provide context in the introduction already. But we're going to talk about, oh my gosh, so many things including obviously the fact that you co-founded and are still running the Institute for Humane Education. Do you know that I applied for the Institute for Humane Education? What What do you mean? I applied to be a humane educator, a certified humane educator back in 2003. Well, what happened? Why? <laughs> That's a different why conversation. Did, why didn't you go through the program? I, the different reasons. Yeah. I, cause, cause wow. it started a back and forth and I don't know who it was, who I started with, but I found my application in, um, in, on my desktop from 2003 is when oh I, oh my gosh, do you know how honored I would be to have you as a graduate of our graduate program? And it's not too late. Not too late. <laughs> I probably changed my application a bit. I was looking at it. I was like, Oh gosh, they really, I could have done better than that. Oh my gosh. Well, now we have a doctoral program too. So so impressive. Actually, why don't you just talk more about that? Because I don't think people realize how systemic and how profound it is what you've done with the Institute for Human Education. Tell everyone about, about it and what it, how it started and, and what it means. Oh, thank you. So well, we started the Institute, Teresa Cora and I, in 1996. And it was primarily because, well, we had both been humane educators. I had created a program in Philadelphia. I was going into schools. I was reaching about 10,000 students a year. They were becoming change makers. They were becoming activists. They were changing their own choices. And I thought, this is really powerful. When young people learn about issues in the world, they want to make a difference. So Ray was doing the same thing. And uh, she was working in Wisconsin, Minnesota area. And we ended up working together and we conceived this idea of creating an institute that would train other people to be humane educators who taught about the interconnected issues of human rights and animal protection and environmental sustainability, and that we would promote this movement. And so we ended up creating a graduate program. And it, we are now on the one, two, third university that we have partnered with. So we're with Antioch University now, and it's gone from first being a certificate program to having an MED. And now we have this online program with Antioch University where we offer an MED for educators and people who wanna focus on classroom education. We have an MA for change makers who want to incorporate hum humane education into whatever they're doing. We have a graduate certificate for people that need an advanced degree. And then we have a specialization in humane education through the EDD program at Antioch, the doctorate in education. So that's really training the, the leaders in education to bring humane education. And when I say humane education, I. I have, I've already sort of described that's this interconnection of these issues, 
but we perceive humane education as something that can, can pervade society. So certainly K-12 education, but also higher education, and then everywhere. You know, anybody can be a humane educator in whatever field they are in, and they can bring these issues with the goal of preparing people to be solutionaries. And of course, that's we'll get into that with my new book. But solutionaries are the goal of humane education. So you have the knowledge about these issues and you know how to solve the problems that we face in ways that are good for everyone, people, animals, and the environment. I love that so much because it's so integrated into who we are as human beings and to integrate it into the education system. I mean, what better way? Because we don't come, you know, we don't learn in a vacuum and we don't live in a vacuum. And so the idea that there's even a separation of any of these issues from who we are as human beings and as students of life and students in school and at university or, uh, or, or, you know, in our younger, you know, years, I mean, it's, it's so brilliant. And so do most schools have a space for humane educators or are you kind of, are you really revolutionizing this whole idea? So that's a great question. You know, I, I started off saying I was going into schools, reaching about 10,000 students a year, but these were single presentations or an assembly program. This wasn't integrated into the curricula and that's what needed to change. Teachers needed to integrate these issues into their curricula. So now what we're doing at the Institute for Humane Education is that we have a, a K-12 program that is a solutionary focused program. And so we are training teachers and we have a micro-credential program, a solutionary micro-credential program. And we have just trained our 200th teacher through that program. And these teachers, and, and they're around the globe. So this is in the US, in Canada, we have a big presence in Mexico. We are working with a school that has campuses all over the country and thousands and thousands of students in this school. We're working in Europe. We're working in Asia. We're working in Africa. And the teachers are integrating the solutionary framework, which I'll get into when I talk about my book. They're integrating it into K-12 education, into really any curricula. And these are inquiry to action projects. So students get to work on projects they care about and learn very deeply about the causes of the problem and the interconnected systems that perpetuate the problem and reach out to a variety of stakeholders so that they can collaborate to solve these problems. So they take action, they implement their solutions. So it's incredibly empowering to the students. The students love this. The teachers love it because their students are so engaged. They're actually using the academic skills that the teachers want to impart for this higher good. So it it's such a win for everyone. And because of that, it's being widely adopted in a variety of places. In fact, where you're located in California, we have fairly deep roots at this point. So I, I wrote a book, uh, The World Becomes What We Teach, this one. And the the subtitle is Educating a Generation of Solutionaries. And one of the coordinators in the Office of Education in San Mateo County, which is the county just south of San Francisco, read the book, brought it to the other coordinators. They all sort of gelled around it and said, this needs to be the philosophy and framework for our entire county that serves 113,000 students. So from there, it's gone to other counties in the Bay Area. And these teachers haven't gone through our program because they have, the coordinators themselves have created the curricula around these ideas. So it's it's very organic for those schools. It's gotten incorporated into STEM and it's gotten incorporated into career and technical education so that these students have that instead of just um, looking at technical education as become a builder or a plumber or electrician, this new approach is like, let's look at solutionary careers. So green energy and 
food production that's sustainable and humane, and all these different green careers through career and technical education coming out of a solutionary approach. It's really exciting. Oh, I just got shivers talking I have, about it. True. I have goosebumps. I, I mean, I think the last time I saw you, you were out here maybe I think that was just starting to get going. That would yes, have been that's right. Happening. And I was speaking to teachers and those coordinators in San Mateo County when we saw each other. Yeah, so oh, exciting. I mean, it's just it's so systemic is the word I keep I keep thinking of because you know you don't you can still do whatever you want to do, whatever passion you have, whatever skills you have, and incorporate solutionary thinking into whatever career or vocation you you want to pursue. So let's talk about that term. I mean, I, I love that term and, and words are worms, words are my jam. So I I I love the word and I, I want to unpack it a bit. I suspect perhaps you coined it. I mean I, I associate you with the term. So tell tell us more about the term and and why why solutionary? Why not change maker? Why not activist? Why did you land on that word solutionary? Uh, thank you for asking that. So solutionary, I did not coin it. So uh, an executive director who was with our organization a number of years ago, uh, he coined it, but it was also simultaneously coined in other places. So I know of two other people who coined it sort of around the same time. So, you know, funny how these things happen. When I heard that word, I was all in. I loved the word. Not everybody loves the word. Most people like the word and most people have a sense right away of what it might mean. So I think of a solutionary as a next level change maker. A solutionary is not the same as a problem solver. So an engineer can solve the problem of damming a river or blowing up a mountaintop for coal removal, but they're not a solutionary. Why? Because embedded in the definition of solutionary is an ethical imperative. So we define a solutionary as somebody who can identify unsustainable, unjust, and inhumane systems and transform them in ways that do the most good and the least harm for people, animals, and the environment. So you see there that ethical foundation that's in the very definition of the word. That's not in the definition of a problem solver. The other thing that distinguishes it from, let's say, a humanitarian is that a humanitarian is trying to alleviate suffering and reduce the impacts of harm, but not necessarily to address the causes of that suffering and harm. So a solutionary, by looking at those systems and transforming those systems, is looking at root and systemic causes. And I would say that in terms of activism, a, a solutionary, a, some activism can actually be quite counterproductive and non-strategic. Solutionary, by definition, again, is going to be strategic because it's going to be striving to do the most good and the least harm, looking at all the connections and find and addressing those root and systemic causes. And not all activism does that. So that's why we need this word. And what's interesting is how the word is taking off. Like on the Ezra Klein show last month, he used the word solutionary. John Stewart has used the word solutionary. I wish they would have me on their shows to talk about this and unpack it like we're doing here. Um, but how exciting, right, that these these incredibly brilliant men who are have these incredible shows are now using this word. So it's the word now has a life of its own. I love that. And one of the reasons I like the term is because one of the things I talk about in effective advocacy is how to frame the issues that we need to address in a way that empowers people rather than paralyzes people. And we, especially those of us who are oriented to activism, oriented to action, oriented to advocacy, right? Oriented to solving problems and to be as uh, to solutionary to be solutionaries, is that we are really good at focusing on the problems and we are really good at framing everything as a problem. 
And if everything is a crisis, then nothing is a crisis. And people wind up feeling apathetic and they wind up doing nothing when they just see the problems, the problems, the catastrophes, the problems. And so what I love about solutionary is that it fires in our brain even that there is a solution, that there are solutions and that we can actually get to the root of what those issues are. And so that's one of the reasons I love that word is because we need to focus on what the solutions are. And there are so many solutions out there rather than just dwelling on the problems. And what you've just described is what we call a solutionary mindset. So when we become solutionaries, we are actually cultivating solutionary thinking, which is very specific. Like it, it requires a, a number of parts to, to be successful, but also this solutionary mindset where we look at an issue and we believe that it is solvable. And when we are put in situations as we are almost every day of our lives by media and politics and, and in so many different systems in our culture to choose sides and to think in either or terms, like just think about the debate format in schools, which is you know so ubiquitous. We are asked to argue about two sides of often a fabricated position. And in it, just imagine what would happen if instead of doing that, we we looked at the underlying problem and that instead of arguing, we collaborated to solve that problem. That's a solutionary mindset. And when once we've got it and it's really deep inside of us, whenever we are faced with either ors, we don't go there. You know, we reframe and we look for solutions. It's very powerful. Yeah. What I like about that too is that we're inclined to think in terms of personality and that some people are just oriented to solutions. Some people are not. I mean, you're nothing if you're not open and curious and passionate. So, right. I mean, that is one of, you know, those are some of the characteristics that make you who you are. Right. And I would imagine that you would agree that some of that was innate in you. I mean, some of it is what you came into this world with, right. Some people do come into this world with a bit more shall we say, verve or passion or, right, just kind of orienting toward the world that way. Not everybody does. But what I think is really hopeful about what you're doing and what you're saying is that you can cultivate that perspective. You can cultivate that orientation. You cultivate that mindset so that people can learn the skills for how to think that way, as opposed to just saying, well, I'm just not made that way. I just, I'm not built that way. I can't do that. I That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. So um, yes to everything you said, and, which we might actually talk a little bit about, yes, and, um, I, I am innately very curious. That is absolutely one of my innate qualities, but I'm also very fiery, very, um, inclined to take sides. Uh, I think I have been in my past inclined toward either or thinking. And that's because we all are. I think that that comes naturally to us as human beings. The us versus them is just, mm, it's baked in. So I think the curiosity for sure I came in with, but I have had to cultivate this solutionary mindset because I care about solving problems and it's more strategic. So internally, and, and sometimes, you know, with my husband and my close friends, I am like mad and I'm, you know, this person did this and, and us and them, and I can be all of those things. And then I remind myself how ineffective that is, how unstrategic that is, and what my big goal is, which is to build a world that's more just and sustainable and humane. And so I have really had to temper my fiery nature and cultivate this. And so that is to say, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, I love that. We're so similar. We are so similar. I mean, I think <laughs> it takes that kind of fire to do what you're doing, but to also learn what's right versus what's effective, right? I mean, I talk a lot about this in my own in my own work on effective advocacy, again, in terms of how we frame things, what we call things, what words we use, 
you know, it might be true to say someone's eating a corpse, but is that effective if you're talking to them, right? I mean, so yes, and, and by the way, yes, and is also something when I was reading your book, I mean, I can't even tell you how many things I underlined and we're, we're just so similar. I've known that. And then just diving deeper, you know, for the preparation for our chat, I was just like, yeah, we are so similar. And yes, and <laughs> is people associate me with that. My friends do. My friends. Oh, how funny. So when I saw you say that in the book, talk about that. I mean, I love, I love the yes, and. Sure. So I, at the beginning of the book, I talk about the rules of improvisational comedy and what I've learned from them about being a solutionary. So my husband and I started taking improv comedy classes many, many years ago. And there are these foundational rules in improv comedy. The first is to build relationships. So if anybody, you know, who's listening, watching, uh, ever sees improv comedy, they're going to see actors get on stage. And the first thing they're going to do is they're going to build a relationship. So they, they will name each other. They will name the relationship they have, like saying, you know, hey, mom, I just entered us into the parent-child acrobatic competition at school. So now we know there's a mom, there's a kid, there's an acrobatic competition. And then what mom is going to do next, if she's a good improviser, she's going to yes and that relationship. And by that, I mean, she's going to say yes to it. She's going to embrace it. She's going to be mom. She is not going to say, I'm not your mom and I don't do acrobatics. That Then the scene would just die. So mom says yes and might say, yes, Brian, that's a great idea. And we can finally wear the pink polka dot leotards that I got on eBay. So mom has now added and she's added the pink polka dot leotards. So now the scene is moving forward. So what does this have to do with being a solutionary? So it is so challenging for us to build relationships with people who we consider them. And so we tend to congregate in our in-groups and we avoid building relationships with the people we most need to build relationships with to understand other perspectives, to come up with solutions that can be widely adopted. So to the degree that we are willing to build relationships with people who think differently from us is the degree to which we may be able to then push forward new ideas and also influence them and potentially be influenced, you know, that it's not just one-sided. And then to yes and them. So finding the places where we can agree. So um, uh, last month, right before my book came out, uh, Andy Revkin, who's the former New York Times environmental and climate reporter, uh, he interviewed me for his video cast. And one of the questions he asked me is, a vegan and a hunter walk into a gym, what happens? Well, he knew I was the vegan and I belong to a CrossFit gym and there are lots of people there with diametrically different views than I have, certainly around food, but also around politics and all sorts of things. And so one of my good friends is a hunter there. And what's the yes and with him? The yes and is we both care quite a lot about the environment. And we talk about that and we find those commonalities and then we add the ands. And he knows exactly how I feel. Um, in fact, at one point, his profile picture that he was going to put up was him with a deer who he had killed. And he didn't put it up because of our conversations. Now, I'm not saying that that means that a deer didn't get killed. He did kill that deer. He also eats probably 30% of his food uh, or you know the meat he eats from that one deer, which is saving a lot of chickens, a lot of fishes. I, it's, it's not what I would choose. And we can find places of agreement and then add our and. So those are two rules. Then there's two other foundational rules of improv comedy that really help. One is to bring the love and the other is to help others shine. So what do I mean by bring the love? Oh my gosh, it is so easy for those of us who identify as activists or solutionaries 
to feel anger. We're trying to solve these really, really intense problems that are causing so much destruction and harm. And it is easy to be filled with not only anger, but also hatred for those who are perpetuating so much harm and suffering. To the degree that we can bring love into the world is the degree that we have more influence, that people want to be like us. They want to learn from us because we are not hateful. We are not full of rage. This is a spiritual practice. It is hard work to bring the love. But the reason why it's important on stage is because when you see like anger and hostility and hatred unfolding on stage, it's not funny. I mean, unless you're Larry David, he's like one of the only people who can pull it off. But most people don't find that funny. But when you bring the love, the joy just flows. And then helping to others shine. How can we shine the light on those who are doing good in the world? And, and take the spotlight off ourselves for a little bit to elevate and, and demonstrate the good that is happening. And when we look for that good and we see it and then we share it, we feel more love. So it's kind of like a, a beautiful feedback loop where all of these rules come together, not only to create great scenes on stage in improv comedy, but also to create good solutionary collaboration and solutions. Yeah. It's, it starts with willingness. You know, you started there, you said that you're willing to, I mean, because that's really where it starts is the, is, is, is having the, the willingness to orient yourself or have a conversation with someone who sees the world differently than you do. And I think that's what is troubling me is that when I share my message of compassion, not everybody, but there, you know, there is a group of people who outrightly say, I, I refuse. I refuse to have compassion for them. And then they name the them. And I know who the them are. I know who they are. And, and they, you know, they say, and this is the irony, it's in the guise of compassion. You know, it's kind of wielding compassion in this way as a weapon and saying, you know, in the name of compassion, I will not have compassion for them because the implication is by having compassion for them, you're condoning the behavior or the thinking that you abhor. And it's that's what is so troublesome is that we have to at least start with, by virtue of acknowledging that people have a different perspective, that doesn't mean you're condoning. And because we're, I think we're at a place where people don't even want to have a conversation. By virtue of having a conversation, <laughs> the implication is you're condoning the, you know, kind of, abhorrent thinking or behavior that that person has anyway. So, so willingness is where it starts before you can even get on stage. You have to be willing to get on that improv stage, right? Yeah. And you know, what you just said, I mean, I've seen that a lot in, in a lot, among a lot of activists, whether animal activists, environmental activists, social justice activists, I've seen it in a lot of places. And I remember one time being at a conference where somebody shouted out, I'm tired of people saying that factory farmers aren't bad people, they're just doing a bad thing, and vivisectors aren't bad people, they're just doing a bad thing. What I have to say to anybody who thinks that is F you, but she didn't say F. And I I raised my hand immediately and I said, you know, that we're all bad people, right? We all do things that cause harm and suffering. I mean, at that very conference, there was, you know chocolate, vegan chocolate, but it it may have come from children who were enslaved gathering cocoa beans. I mean, and and wearing clothing that was produced in sweatshops. I mean, all of those things. And and the irony was when I met my husband, he was an animal researcher. And nobody thought our relationship would last, just saying. Mm -hmm. And um he was not he was not a bad person. And and this per and I said that, and the, the woman said, well, he was a bad person. Now he's not a bad person because he'd become a veterinarian. He'd given up his grant. He had gone back to school. He became a veterinarian, became vegan. 
And this idea that he was once a bad person, now he's a good person. The idea that it's so, that's simplistic. And as soon as you start labeling people this way, you lose any power to influence them and to be influenced to be a better person yourself. You know, when I mentioned the thing about sweatshop labor, she's like, that's not my issue. Like, right? Everybody's like got something that's not their issue. Can we learn other issues? Can we all be better people? I'd like to think I'm going to be able to grow to be a better person for the rest of my life. The only way that happens is if I'm open to learning, not just teaching. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting because I, I wonder sometimes how that plays out in the real world. And I know that there are conflicts between people in the real world. I know that there are families who are not talking because of politics and because of different issues. And I know that. And I do think that it can be exaggerated a bit when we just see someone at a conference or someone online say it in a safe place where they just say, no, 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 they don't deserve it. How does that actually play out? Do you ask everybody you sit with or pass by or your doctor or people that you interact with on a daily basis? Like, do you ask them their political orientation and then say you're going to speak to them or not? Like, I mean, we don't play it out that way, right? So some of it is just knowing that we 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 engage with each other all the time in ways that we where we protect each other. I mean, we drive next to people on the freeway where, you know, we're not hitting them with our car because they might have a different, you know, different perspective of the world than we do. So we we are capable of practicing th that kind of compassion and openness. And, you know, we just have to kind of take it to the next step of, I think, even in our own minds, because I think obviously the way we even think about a group of people in our minds before we even interact with them really affects us. You know, and that's the biggest mistake for me. I mean, this isn't a conversation about compassion, but that's the biggest mistake I see people make all the time is that they don't realize that compassion, you know, it's, it, 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 it changed. It, it's, it's not about how anybody else behaves. It's about how we behave, right? It's not like, I don't determine how compassionate I'm going to be based on someone else's personality and behavior or voting record, right? The question isn't, are they compassionate? and thus deserving of my compassion. The question is, am I compassionate and thus willing to give it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, and what happens us. if you're, what happens if you're, you know, you have a fire in your house and the firefighter comes and that firefighter has voted for somebody you can't stand or does something you don't like? Are you, you still want that firefighter in your house to put out that fire? And what about that firefighter who doesn't agree with you and is putting out your fire anyway? You're going to feel a little gratitude. You're going to feel compassion for the very hard, dangerous job that they have taken on that just saved maybe your pets and maybe your house. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to pause for a second because some tree work has just begun and I don't usually have this issue. Do you hear anything? I have a directional mic and you shouldn't hear anything. No. Nope. I'm going to try and tighten the window just a little bit. Hang on. So annoying. Oh. Yeah, I had to ask Edwin to... Um not mow I'm like I'll be able to mow between four and five <laughs> yeah, same with David I had you I'm like you can't get your lunch he's like I'm he's like I'm the only time I have between meetings is one o'clock I said like, you can't get it you gotta get it before then so it it sounds like you're okay it doesn't you know hopefully this will be okay the worst the worst thing in the world is we'd have to have a conversation again I don't want to do yeah. that um, <laughs> I don't want to have to do that so yeah absolutely I mean absolutely how does this play out in our in in the real world and I mean, I think what's so beautiful about the work that you do, both professionally, but also personally, just who you are in this world, so is that just by virtue of you showing up and obviously providing all of the skills and wisdom that you have and and sharing that with the world, but just by virtue of sh showing up, people go, oh, there's another way. Like, I, I, I didn't know there was another way. And one of the things I love, especially about the introduction and this is something I talk about all the time, is that we can hold both things as true at once, which is that there are problems in the world to solve and things have 
improved. And we need to be able to look at what's improved so we can learn from them. And as you've said, we can learn what the collaborations look like and how we can solve these together. But to say that everything's, again, awful and the world's going to end and nothing's gotten better, why then don't we just all give up? And I love that you're there to say, yes, and <laughs> things are, we have, we have problems we have to solve and um, we can look to ways they have been solved in the past and move forward. Yeah. As I say in my book, things can be bad and better at the same time. And you know, so much has changed for the better in my own lifetime. I, I mean, issues of sexism, issues of racism, pollution in the United States, water pollution and air pollution, better now than when I was a kid. And rivers and lakes were catching on fire and smog and soot coated our cities. Now, we know in other countries, it's really bad. We know that biodiversity, things are really bad. Climate change is really bad. But if we don't acknowledge the ways that we have come together to solve some problems so far, and we have a long way to go, and sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back, we're seeing a lot of rights eroded. There's a lot to be worried about. I am not Pollyanna-ish about any of this. But without acknowledging what can improve, there's a sense of hopelessness. Can I tell a story about um, what happened in a school a number of years ago? Okay, so this was about 12 years ago. So pre-pandemic, pre-massive wildfires all over the world, pre like levels of polarization that are out of control. I was invited to speak at a middle school in Connecticut and I asked the fifth and sixth graders what they thought were the biggest problems in the world. And their responses filled a big whiteboard. And then I asked them to raise their hands if they could imagine us solving the problems they listed. And of the 45 children in that classroom, only five raised their hand. Only five could even imagine that we could solve those problems. So I knew I had to do something right away. <laughs> So I had the kids close their eyes and I led them in a guided visualization in which I asked them to imagine that they were very old, approaching the end of a long and well-lived life. And at the end of their life, the world was really different. The air was clean, the waterways were clean, the birds were singing. There hadn't been a war in as long as they could remember. Nobody went to bed hungry. We had learned to treat each other and other species with respect and compassion. And then I asked them to imagine a child coming up and joining them at, at the end of their life and asking them a series of questions about how things got better. And then the child asks a final question. What role did you play in helping to bring about this better world? What did you do? So after leading them through this visualization, while their eyes were still closed, I asked them to raise their hands if now they could imagine us solving the problems they listed on the whiteboard. And this time, 40 hands went up in the air. All it took to restore their hope was imagining a better world was possible and knowing they played a role in it. So a couple of years later, I was invited to speak in a school in Mexico. And when I arrived, I asked the fifth graders whether they thought we could solve the problems in the world, and every hand flew up in the air immediately. Mm -hmm. What was different? What was different was their teacher had been teaching them in age-appropriate ways about problems, specifically environmental problems, and they were involved in solving them. They knew problems could be solved because they were learning to be solutionaries. So the take-home message from these two stories is that when you learn to be a solutionary, and when you are a solutionary, you do what Professor David Orr said, hope is. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And when you roll up your sleeves, another person said this, he's a, who's even more famous, Joan Baez. She said, action is the antidote to despair. When you roll up your sleeves and you act, you restore your own hope because you see the positive impacts of your actions. You know that a better world is possible because you're creating it. And that's what each of us have to do. We have to be part of creating that better world. And we have to be really strategic about it, which means we have to learn to be solutionaries, which is why I wrote my book.
<laughs> I love it. I love it. Have you ever heard of um, Rebecca Solnit's? She wrote the book Hope in the Dark, which I don't know if you've read, but yes. she talks about. I love it so much. She talks about how we tend to frame hopelessness as darkness, and that you know, many of us are afraid of the dark. And so she talks about how the future is dark, but it's not dark because it's bleak. It's dark because it's inscrutable because it hasn't been written yet. And so mm. we have to write that future. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That's exactly what you're saying is we have to write the stories and who else is going to do it, but us. I mean, we can let someone else write the story. We can do that and just give away our power and and creativity and and all of the and our solutionary uh, impulses or we could we could write the story ourselves speaking of stories one of the things i really appreciate about, about you is you you take your own beingness your own personality your own life and you apply that to your lessons that you're learning which i love cuz you're always sharing your lessons and you use them as you know, jumping off points for lessons to teach. Have you always been a natural storyteller? I, I find stories something that comes very naturally to you. Is that something you teach also in in this you know kind of solutionary framework, or is that something that that's very personal to you? Um, I think we remember the stories. So let's say somebody's listening to this podcast, and uh, a couple of weeks go by. And something triggers their memory and somebody says, oh, yeah, what did what was that about? They may remember that story about the fifth graders. They probably won't. I mean, I haven't, you know, delineated the the solutionary framework and the four phases of it. But I bet if if I do talk about that, they won't remember that. They'll remember the story. And we are a storytelling species. And so I tell stories because... It is the, I mean, I, I like telling stories too. I like listening to stories, but it's also the gateway into learning and embodying new ideas. And it's not to say that we always need stories. I mean, I read a lot, a lot of nonfiction where there's no stories. And I often like that nonfiction. I tend to not remember it as well. Mm. as I remember the, the, the places mm. where there are stories. Mm. So interspersed in the solutionary way are a number of stories because when you get into the actual framework and the phases of being a solutionary, and I'll just say it, which is identify the problem you want to solve, investigate it thoroughly. These are all I's, so it helps to remember them. Innovate a solution and then implement your solution. So those are the four phases. And if I just wrote the book, and it's just the four phases and there are no stories and examples. And it's just like, this is how you do it. There would be people who want to read that book because they really want to know how to do this because they really care. And we'd lose a lot of people who don't learn that way. And they need to, to hear the stories and hear the examples and have it woven throughout. So I've tried to make the book something that anybody's going to enjoy reading, not just like, oh, I need to be a solutionary. How do I do this? But this is going to en enrich my life. This is going to enliven me, which it does because it, it brings meaning and purpose and hope in the process. And it also provides mirror. I mean, I think that's what stories do as well, because people are always thinking about how something you're saying applies to them. Not necessarily, not ne and I don't mean that in, you know, the most selfish way. It is somewhat selfish, but it's not a negative thing necessarily. We're always looking out for ourselves, just kind of like we were talking about the, the tribalism, you know, tribalism has its place, you know, when you're rooting for your favorite sports team or, you know, or what have you, I mean, it has its place. It's when it gets to the extreme, to the exclusion of, and superiority, inferiority is when it's problematic. But but people are always looking for ways to identify with something that's being shared with them. And it's one of the reasons I encourage people to tell their story of compassion, their story of awakening, their story of transformation kind of coming to this place. So I would ask you, could you share with our Food for Thought listeners what your story was, what your story of transformation was and how you got to where you are now? 
Sure. So I was a super sensitive kid, um, both personally, you know, I could easily have my feelings hurt, but also toward others. So, you know, if there was a movie where there was any kind of cruelty depicted, whether to humans or animals, I was wrecked. I was sobbing. But I didn't grow up in an in a household where I was ever encouraged or taught to try to solve those problems or end suffering. I mean, we were not an activist family. You know, we were a you got to vote family, but but that's pretty much where it ended. So I never I, I always thought that I would have a career and that if I was going to do something good, it would be associated with that career. Um, I actually went to college pre-med. Um, that that didn't last all that long. And and then the more I learned about different issues, the more I felt like I had to do something, even though I had no idea what doing something was. So I was in graduate school and I was looking for a summer job. So I should say that I started pre-med. I ended up with getting my bachelor's and master's in English literature, try to find a job with that. I went to law school, dropped out by Thanksgiving of the first year, then went to, then worked for a while, then went to divinity school to study comparative world religions. Like I was like the definition of a dilettante, did not know where I was heading. So while I was in divinity school and looking for a summer job, I found this program that offered week-long courses to middle school students at the University of Pennsylvania, which was my alma mater. And so I pitched a whole bunch of courses, which of course I could pitch because I'd been a dilettante. So I knew a little about a lot of things, enough to teach a week-long course to middle schoolers. So I pitched all these, these courses. One was on animal issues, uh, which I was passionate about. One was on environmental issues. I pitched one on media literacy, but there weren't enough kids who wanted to analyze television shows. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I actually think a media literacy class would be very popular among uh, among tweens now, but it wasn't then. Anyway, so the animal issues course was the second most popular of the 60 courses that were offered that summer. And one of the days in that class, I taught about product testing on animals. So you know, most of your listeners probably know about product testing, where anything from personal care products to oven cleaner, shampoo, are dripped into the eyes of conscious rabbits and force-fed to animals in quantities meant to kill and smeared on their abraded skin. So I taught them about this, and one boy went home that night, 12-year-old boy, and he made his own homemade leaflets. This was in 1987. He hand-wrote his leaflets. He came back into class the next day and he wanted to hand them out, but not to his fellow classmates. They'd all learned about this. He wanted to hand them out on the street. So while the rest of us were having lunch, he was standing out on a Philadelphia street corner, handing out his homemade leaflets. He become an activist overnight. A, a few years later, some of the kids in that class went on to form a Philadelphia area-wide student group. They won awards for their work. I hadn't seen one of them. I'm still in touch with both of those students all these years later, but I hadn't seen one of them for 18 years. And I was going to be in New York and I was going to be speaking at an event with Jane Goodall. And he had become uh, he had begun working for the mayor of New York on HIV AIDS issues. So he'd stayed a, an activist. And he was working for the mayor's office. He still works for the mayor's office, many mayors later, later. And I invited him to come to this event. He did. And I introduced him to some friends afterward. I said, this is David. He was in the very first humane education course I ever taught. And before I could finish that sentence, he interjected, that course changed my life. Oh my gosh. That course changed my life. That's when I realized I'd found my path. Oh, I just got shivery again. That's when like all those years of being a dilettante, there, there was no such thing as a comprehensive humane educator who taught about the interconnected issues of human rights, environmental sustainability and animal protection. I had to build that field. And, and so it took me a while to find it and to find my path. So here's how my story can relate to anybody who's listening. 
there are three questions that we can ask ourselves as potential solutionaries. The first question is, what problems do you want to solve? What issues do you care about? The second question to ask yourself is, what are you good at? Now, you might be good at lots and lots and lots of things. There might be plenty of things you don't even know you're good at yet. But what do you know you're good at right now? And then the third question is, what do you love to do? Because if you can find the place where the answers to those three questions meet, you're going to be a solutionary. You are going to find meaning and purpose in your life. Your life's going to be pretty golden. That's how I feel about my life, is I found those places. I was good at teaching. I loved it. And I could teach about what I cared about. And I could build this humane education movement, which is now like this become really the solutionary movement and it's traveling around the globe. And it's because I lucked out and found the answers to those three questions before I even knew to ask them. Now, anybody listening to this knows to ask themselves these questions. Go on this journey because your life matters so much, not just for you, but for everybody you impact through your choices and your actions. I love that. That's so helpful. That's so helpful. And I'm tempted, of course, to ask what keeps you going because you've been doing this for so long. But I think I know the answer. I'd still love to hear you answer that question. What keeps it fresh for you? What keeps you What keeps you doing this? You've been doing this for so long, so I'm so grateful to you for your dedication and your passion. What, what keeps you going? Uh, a lot of things. I, I work with an amazing team. Like this work attracts amazing people. And our team is just growing and growing. And it's one more amazing person after another. So like, how lucky am I that I get to work with amazing people? So that keeps me going. Seeing the work spread, seeing the, the way people are responding, that keeps me going. But I also really, I'm really good at taking care of myself. I cannot, I cannot be, so I described my fiery nature. In the book, I talk about um, a metaphor of fires, one a campfire and one a forest fire. So a campfire draws everybody close. Everybody bathes in that glow. Everybody wants to be there. But if we put too much fuel on that fire and it starts to send sparks up, it can ignite a a forest fire, and then everybody's fleeing. Nobody wants to be near that, right? So each of us has a fire inside of us, and I and everybody has to tend their fire really carefully. If you don't put any fuel on your fire, and by fuel I mean knowledge about the problems in the world, you're not going to have a fire at all. Um, and people aren't going to learn from you. You're not going to solve problems because you don't even know what to solve. If you put too much fuel on that fire and more and more fuel on that fire, you may be so full of rage and hatred and you you become a forest fire. Nobody wants to be near you. And so tending that fire is really important. So the way I tend my fire is I take in the suffering and destruction in the world in chunks. I don't spend all day, every day, learning about, thinking about the horrible things in the world. I go outside for a walk, I meditate, I exercise, I play with our dogs, I have friendships, I have my husband. I nurture myself so that I have the resilience to be a campfire when I am dealing with those issues. And we all have to find that balance for ourselves. You know, there's a reason for that word burnout when people have just put too much fuel on their fire and they burn out, then they're no good to anyone. So I encourage everybody to find that balance and surround yourself with people who are also finding that balance. Because if you surround yourself only with people who are angry and bitter and full of hate, it, it's it's probably going to impact you and 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 feed on itself. Yeah, yeah. I love that so much. It's so, so important. And I love following you on social media. I love 
seeing the nature that surrounds you, the home you live in, your gorgeous photography and videography, the animals, wildlife, the trees, all of it. It's really inspiring. And I encourage everyone to follow you. I'll make sure I include those, those links to follow you on social media and obviously a link to get your new book, The Solutionary Way, Transform Your Life, Your Community and the World for the Better. You have certainly transformed this world for the better. So I know you can put your head on the pillow at night and know that at least you are sharing your love and passion and compassion with the world. And I have been touched by it. And I know you've touched just thousands and thousands of people. And I'm so grateful to you. And I'm so grateful to you for writing this book for the lay folks. It's not just for educators. It's definitely for everyone who wants to learn how to apply solutionary, learn solutionary thinking to begin with, and then apply that solutionary thinking to their, to their lives, to their work, to their relationships, and all the ways that we can just continue making this world a better place. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, because I feel exactly the same way about you. So it's a mutual admiration society, and I'm truly grateful for you having me on your show. I think so. Thank you. Thank you.